Your new book is Pay Any Price, Greed, Power and Endless War. You're quoting John Kennedy here. Yes, yes. And um, I think that's what we have done since 9-11. We've paid an enormous price in the name of uh, what we, st we started this war after 9-11, this global war on terror, uh, in order to uh, seek justice or retribution or whatever you, however you want to characterize the attitude of America right after 9-11. Uh, but today it's become essentially a, a search for cash. And um, there's lots of people involved in the war on terror today who are doing it because they're ambitious, because they want status or power or money. And um, it's, I think of it kind of in the historical sense, the historical context is kind of like in the Middle Ages when you had the Thirty Years' War or the Hundred Years' War in Europe, where you developed a whole new class of mercenary soldiers who all they did their entire careers is go from one country to another to uh, fight wars for money. Well, as you expose a great deal and pay any price, you yourself are under, as I just documented, mm -hmm. enormous pressure. Right. How do you continue to write these front page pieces for The New York Times, write this book, Pay Any Price, as you face the possibility of years in jail? Well, it's the it's what I do. It's my job. It's you know, um, it's what keeps me sane is to keep keep going. Um, if I just gave in to them, then they <laughs> then I would be you know uh, failing in what I want to do. I want to uh, keep finding out the truth. It's the thing I've tr tried to do my whole life is be a reporter and be a, a writer. It's the only thing I know how to do. <laughs> well. In a moment, we're going to talk extensively about these stunning revelations and pay any price. But if you could go back to what you revealed before Edward Snowden mm -hmm. um, and how it eventually uh, came uh, into the New York Times that won it and you a Pulitzer mm -hmm. Prize. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, the I guess you mean the original NSA stories. We um, in in 2004. Um, uh, Eric Lischblau and I had a number of different sources who began to tell us um, early on in, in, in 2004 uh, that they were very, they knew something really big, they knew the biggest secret in the government, but they couldn't tell us because they were so nervous. They were very tortured by what they knew, and it took months of uh, kind of patience and talking and reporting for Eric and I to figure out exactly what it was uh, that they were talking about. And finally, we were able to piece it all together. And in the fall of 2004, we had the story ready to go. I had a, a, a great confrontation over the telephone with Michael Hayden, who you just saw, um, where I read him that I got him on the phone kind of by bluffing the PR person at the NSA and said, I need to talk to him right now. And uh, I was shocked. I, he got on the phone and I read him the top of the draft of the story and he goes, <gasps> and, uh, and that's when I knew we had it. And, um, and so we had the story ready, but then by, you know, then Hayden and the government started to crack down on the New York Times and, and uh, pressured them to hold the story till, uh, even though it was ready about two or three weeks before the election in mid mid October, two thousand four, uh, and then after the election. Well, wait. Can you yeah. just explain what does it mean when the government pressures you know the leading newspaper in the United States? <clears throat> well, they, what does that look like? Do they do they march through the um, offices of the New York Times into Bill Keller, the executive editor's office? No. It, well, usually what they ask is for us to go to them. <laughs> uh, the first meeting was between. Uh, uh, I think in er, it was in probably early October, late September of 2004, between me and the Washington bureau chief at the time, Phil Taubman, and uh, John McLaughlin, who was then the acting CIA director, and his uh, chief of staff, John Mosman, uh, and we met at the CIA director's uh, downtown office at the old executive office building, and it was a very funny meeting because at that time uh, they didn't want to acknowledge that the story was right. They didn't want to officially acknowledge. 
And so they had all these hypothetical, we had this very weird hypothetical conversation where they kept saying, well, if you were to, if, if, if the government was doing what you say they were doing, it would be very bad for you to reveal that. <laughs> and, uh, and then they, then that was just the beginning of a whole series of meetings with the editors uh, and us, uh, the reporters, in which they said that this is the crown jewel of the U.S. counterterrorism operation and that if you reveal this, this will uh, damage national security. And so that was essentially the argument that they used then and they used throughout the entire process. Well, it went higher than you and yeah, the Washington it kept editor. Going higher and higher and higher. Uh, and right the election is coming closer and yeah, closer and yeah, closer. Yeah, and they met with uh, Taubman and Keller, and when, then we had, you know, the, we and the newspaper, the editors and reporters met uh, to discuss the story, and uh, Bill Keller decided to hold it. Um, and then, and then the election, you know, so he decided to not run it before the election, and then after the election— I mean, do you think yeah. it could have changed the election? I mean, explain the nut yeah. of your revelation. Basically, the story was that we found out that the U.S. was spying on Americans. Uh, the NSA was spying on Americans electronically, listening to their phone calls, uh, international phone calls, back and forth with uh, people overseas. Uh, and gathering lots of, uh, doing lots of data mining uh, on their phone and email, uh, and uh, listen, and also getting the content of their email, and doing that without court approval. And they were going around the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act uh, court, which had been set up specifically for that purpose of providing secret warrants for spying on uh, for eavesdropping on um, spies and terrorists, or uh, suspected spies and terrorists. And the government had decided to go around the law, go around the courts, and not tell anyone else that they were doing that, except a couple hand-picked people in Congress, who were like the chairman of the intelligence committees. Uh, and they were keeping this secret uh, from everyone, so they could do it on a, on a vast scale. and. Um, we believe that what we were, what the people who talked to us about it believed that it was unconstitutional. And that's why we were pursuing it.